My name is Christian von Königsegg. I'm 40 years old and for half of my life I've been on the quest to be a leader in the hypercar industry, utilizing Swedish design combined with visionary technical solutions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, 3D printing and laser scanning technology we use here at Koenigsegg. These tools are getting more and more common and more available to anyone, but I guess we have implemented a very straightforward and efficient way of using them. And I would like to start to talk about our new one-to-one -one seat. Uh, this has came quite late into the program. We felt we really needed to save weight and get an even more race-inspired seat. And to design a seat from scratch in the computer, without being able to sit in it, uh, most likely will not end up in a very comfortable seat or, or, or space efficient or optimized. So what we did was we, we basically started cutting and shutting together this very rough uh, model inside a monocoque uh, uh, chassis of a car. And I sat in it and some other people sat in it and we tried all these different types of cushions and things and we were sewing and, and laminating and, and filling with uh, uh, with filler and just roughly cutting it together. It's not even 100% symmetrical, but that doesn't really matter as long as it's fairly even and you can get a feel for what it is. Then when we were happy, we took our uh, laser scanner. Uh, we threw out these kind of small dots everywhere so the laser scanner eye here can track exactly where the seat is in, in the space and you can move it around with no problem. And then we laser scan this like this from different angles and then it pops up onto a laptop screen and becomes a, what we call a cloud file of dots. And then we can throw that in computer and create skins and perfect class A surfaces and perfect symmetrical shapes. So this project we started uh, just shy of uh, four weeks ago. And uh, tomorrow night, the, uh, the, one, the first one-to-one -one development car will leave with two uh, almost production-ready version of those seats for the Geneva Motor Show. So from from idea, trying to sit in something, to CAD file, uh, to tool, to two carbon fiber seats with custom made foam and leather pieces and everything in four weeks. Uh, just to explain how fast it's possible to work when using this kind of uh, empirical uh, backwards and forward methodology between 3D CAD and reality. So many of the parts, of course, uh, uh, we first 3D print uh, off of CAD data to try in the car. This is a new one-to-one -one, uh, brake pedal. Uh, this is a new one-to-one -one throttle pedal. They are machined normally out of aluminium. They're adjustable uh, for different uh, angles and length of uh, legs and so on. And uh, this way we could uh, try them in a the car. I wouldn't want to go driving on a racetrack with these, but you can sit in the car, see how they feel, try spring loads, try positions. Um, if needed, modify them by hand until they're exactly how we want them and then we laser scan them and throw them back into the computer again. So we, we printed out this piece, tried it in a car, uh, this footrest, uh, two different positions for uh, comfort and uh, spirited driving. And then we modified that by hand, laser scanned it, refined it in the computer, printed a, an alu aluminum tool with this shape and we made this carbon piece for the first one-to-one -one car. Also, this happened in like a seven, eight days period from first idea to finished product. So you can move really, really quickly. Um, foot for a new wing mirror, new wing mirror housing, which we could try on the car. Uh, we first CFD'd it in the computer to check the aerodynamics and then tried it on our test Agera to see how it worked in reality just by printed plastic. This is ABS plastic. It's quite a good, strong material to print out of which is actually uh, long lasting over time. And we actually, since the last four or five years, we have been printing uh, air ducts for HVAC units and stuff like that. And some air guides from the front wheel arches, a few bits and pieces, interior pieces in the wing mirror for production cars actually out of this material. So in low volume, it makes sense to print parts which are fairly arbitrary and not very highly loaded. Uh, like guides and things like that. Um, but in the last few years, it also has uh, come, came up the possibility to print metal parts in titanium, aluminum, steel, and so on. And we just printed for the one-to-one -one car 
one of the largest pieces in the world, printed out of titanium, the exos piece. It saves almost one kilo to compare to our aluminium machine exhaust stand piece. It's much more expensive, but very much lighter and something very unique and, and cool to have on the car. As it's also far back, it's important to save a lot of weight there. Uh, we're also printing uh, our um, variable turbine housing for our turbos for the one-to-one. -one. Uh, it's very intricate shapes that we have found really difficult to uh, cast. So we've had a great freedom of design when we 3D printed as you're totally unrestricted of draft angles and things like that. Um, so for production we're actually 3D printing our turbine housings for our turbos to have the variable patented Koenigsegg solution. Um, and we're going more and more into metal 3D printing because at the low volume we're at, it is very costly to make production tooling and only making 10, 15, 20 pieces per year out of them. So we can actually use that as an argument to pay a lot for 3D uh, printed metal parts as we save tooling cost, we save tooling time, and we can make impossible, otherwise impossible shapes that are more efficient and lighter then our competitors uh, can do, ev even if they're only at, well, a production volume of maybe 100 cars, they can't motivate the 3D printing cost because then they save so much money by making a tool. But at this volume, we can motivate not saving the money by making a tool because it doesn't cost much more at this uh, production level to 3D print and get the benefit of imp otherwise impossible shapes. So uh, pretty much all 3D printing works by the same principle. When you work with plastic materials like this ABS material, you have a table which is slowly moving downwards and then you have a nozzle melting the plastic onto the table layer by layer. So in this case where you have kind of this hollowness, how do you print on the edge in the air? Well, it also prints a support material behind it uh, so it can stabilize and push onto that. And this we melt away in water after the piece is ready. So it's basically a table moving down and you're squirting out like cake material almost and you're building support with another uh, nozzle simultaneously where needed. Uh, the metal uh, printing solutions are a little bit different. Basically they fill up the cabin with uh, uh, a thin layer of powder onto the table of metal powder and then they have a laser or an electron beam welding that powder together where they want and then they there is a scraper to scrape on another thin layer of metal powder and then that's welded on top of the first uh, uh, area they welded and then they then they spread up on another thin layer of, of powder and then they keep on doing that until there is a metal part in a powder of the same material that you just shake off when you take it out. And that support material is usually made out of the same material as the part is made of but it's only uh, attached with very small fine points you can fairly easily usually crack it off or knock it off and then fine polish the part. So in simple terms that's how 3D printing works. It's pretty straightforward in a sense. There's also very exciting news uh, coming out now of carbon fiber 3D printing machines which we're uh, looking closely at. So that could also revolutionize uh, how carbon fiber is produced uh, and especially in low volume. <laughs>